Former U.S. Surgeon General uh, Vivek Murthy, writing in the Harvard Business Review, he said, during my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease or diabetes. It was, any guesses? It was loneliness. Loneliness. He was supported by a massive amount of data, large body of research culled from more than two hundred studies involving three million subjects that spanned across the whole of the planet. And it showed that we are in the midst of what they're now calling a loneliness epidemic. A few months ago, uh, just last year, a massive survey of 20,000 U.S. adults confirmed his assertion. They found out that one out of two of us feel alone very often. We feel alone. That means half of the population is saying, I don't have the kind of connections that I want. One out of four say they rarely or never feel understood. Can you imagine how isolating it would be to go through life surrounded by people and not actually have people who know you or understand you? To always kind of feel like you're on the outs when the rest of the people are in the in? Two out of five often feel like relationships are not meaningful. So that means they actually have relationships, like of course all of us do, and to hit two out of five, that means you're talking about people within families and you're talking about spouses and you're saying, and the people who are connected to friends and coworkers and they're saying they're just, it's true, I have these relationships, but they don't, they don't really matter in the way I need them to. One out of five rarely feel close to people. Going through your life, some 20% of us saying, I just don't have the proximity that I need to feel whole, to feel complete. To have one out of two people who don't have a single meaningful social interaction during a single day. So imagine going an entire day without having a, just even a few moments of connect time with your family or going through an entire day without a significant conversation with another person. We're just, just kind of skating across the surface of our relationships. The epidemic is actually more dangerous than some of the other health concerns. Now here's the thing, I'm not actually like, I'm, I'm not like, a, like a, a no smoker kind of guy or anything. I'm not saying I, you know, I think we all should be smoking. I'm, I, I'm not, uh, I'm, there's a whole lot of things that I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, these are fine, these are moderate, whatever. 15 cigarettes a day. I think most of us would say to a friend, hey, come on man, 15 cigarettes, I want you around a long time. Right? The doctors are all telling us the same thing. This is, you know, we, we, all, we all go to the hospital. We visit friends who's, who, you know, who, whose insides are being ripped up because of 15, 16, 20. And they're saying that loneliness is more damaging to your health than 15 cigarettes a day. More damaging than the obesity epidemic we hear so much about. They're talking about losing weight, eat better, all this kind of stuff. It has... Loneliness has a more negative impact on your health than these other kinds of social concerns. It's also associated with increased depression, dementia, anxiety, cancer, insomnia, higher rates of depression, which lead to, of course, drug use. When you get older, you have to look forward to a more rapid cognitive decline. All because we are disconnected from other people. When industry gets into this, they start looking about out, out how loneliness affects productivity in workers, and guess what they find? We are less effective employees 
as our loneliness increases. It affects performance, task performance, it limits creativity, it impairs reasoning and decision making. The people managing your portfolio, the people driving your buses and flying your planes, all of it. Loneliness has increasingly negative impacts on how we perform in industry. You know, we spend so much time talking about getting healthy, and by that we usually mean don't do a couple of these kinds of things and do more of these things like eat and, 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 and exercise, and that's all great, that's fine. But do we talk about the need for deep friendships? Now you might be saying, listen, I got the, I, I'm surrounded by family though. You know, I got family everywhere, but are those family connections really the meaningful relationships that you need? Because the research indicates that they're not quite enough. Your spouse and your kids can certainly buy you some time, and they can take the edge off of some of these things, but the research indicates that they're not enough, that your immediate family isn't enough. It indicates that we need more and broader and, and diverse connections with others who are not related to us through marriage or birth. We need more. Surgeon General Vivek also said that for our health and our work, it is imperative that we address the loneliness epidemic quickly. So what happened? Well, how did things shift? When you look at it, you realize, wait, in some ways, we've always faced these problems, but right now we're experiencing them a little bit more acutely than we ever have. Why? Well, because things are changing so rapidly in the way we live, the way we work. How many people just, they, they move all the time now. So we're getting uprooted from communities that we've only been invested in for a handful of years. We're not working the same jobs as long as we used to. So the, the friendships there haven't developed. Social organizations are in decline, like the VFWs and the American Legions, and maybe you're like one of the ethnic societies, right? Italian-American or the Portuguese-American society there. These organizations are in decline. They also point to the gig economy, which sounds so great for so many of us. You have more freedom. You can work from home. You can, you know, work from a coffee shop, and this is great. Except they're saying, yeah, but, but you're, you're lacking the, the connections that would naturally have been built into our workplace. There are more single people in the U.S. than ever, and we're getting married later and having smaller families. Social media, of course, they're saying, isn't really helping as we kind of scroll through this endless stream of, you know, parties and, and vacations and family gatherings and weddings, and it increases a sense of uh, being left out. They say the top 25% of social media users we're twice as likely to report feeling lonely as the people who are using it less. But of course, we also know that it is, it's more than just some shifts in culture. It's more than us simply being busier. As we start to examine the breakdown in relationships, we see that something is actually fundamentally wrong with how we relate to each other. And that's where the message of the scriptures comes in so importantly for us. So if you can open in a Bible to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, background to the book. We're going to do a little bit more of next week, but um, just for purposes today, it's helpful to know it was written uh, 2,000 years ago by St. Paul to a church in the city of Ephesus. And... For some really good background, just read the first two chapters when you get home and you'll kind of see what's being framed out. I won't be able to develop, develop a lot of that this morning. But we will get to see how isolation and loneliness is actually part of this broken and fallen world that we live in. So starting in uh, Ephesians 2, verse 12. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. So he uses this phrase, separate from Christ. And of course, how did that happen? How did we become separated 
from Christ, from God, but from people. For that story, you'd have to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. It's the Garden of Eden. And we see how sin entered into the human relationships, the ones that were meant for intimacy, for closeness, for, for community, and sin entered in and tore us apart. The man and the woman immediately were separated from each other when sin entered. And then their, their sons, Cain and Abel, immediately murderous behavior enters into the family. And then society starts to break down all the way through into the story of the Tower of Babel when the nations get scattered. And so you go back to the beginning of the Bible and you see that sin entered into the story and so we were separated from God and from his people. Or, or another way of phrasing it, separated from Christ. But that's not what it was how we were originally designed. Originally we were designed for relationship. We were designed for community. But now our sin from our ancestors and the sin that is in us it continues to drive us further and further into isolation. The word that is used here for separate, it isn't used that often in the New Testament, but it has to do with this idea of being alienated or, or, or being estranged, kind of like how we would say, you know, there was a big fight in the family years and years and years ago, and now the, you know, the two brothers are estranged from each other. You know, the son is no longer talking to his dad and hasn't from years. They're, he's estranged from his dad. It's a familial kind of a word. And this estrangement causes distances to grow between us, which, of course, increases our loneliness. C.S. Lewis, he, uh, if you like his fiction stuff, one of his great books is called The Great Divorce. And uh, if, you've, if you're not familiar with it, it's great. You should check it out if you're into Lewis's fiction because it's just every bit as good as all of his, his other stuff. Well, this is his attempt to explain what hell would be like and what heaven would be like, but of course in kind of a creative, uh, creative fictional way. And what he does is he creates a picture of hell very different than the one that most of us grew up with. You know, we have this picture, we have this the imagery of hell, and there's like fire and suffering and, and, and all of this, and it's kind of like an active punishment scene as we picture it. And that wasn't what he did. He, he pictured a town that when you get to hell, you get deposited in there, and you just think up a house, and you have a house, and now you're part of a neighborhood. But it's all kind of gray and, and bleak and dreary. But quickly after showing up there, you're going to argue with one of your neighbors. And because of the fight, because of the disagreement, you decide to move out to the outskirts of town, which you do. So you move further out, but it's only a short period of time before you run into another neighbor. And then you guys fight and you have a problem. There's a conflict between you. So you decide to move further out. And every time you move out, your new place appears, your new house, all the streets around it. And so what it leaves are all of these, these thousands of miles of empty houses and empty streets so that you might live a million miles away from your closest neighbor because you've been so irritated and frustrated by them. And so you see the picture that he's pointing is that the sin in us actually extends uh, us further pushes us further and further away from each other. So his dominant idea of suffering in hell is being alone. It's being estranged from each other. And there are really two estrangements that Paul is talking about here. If you see in verse 12, he says, without hope and without God. So humanity tells us, is separated from God. We're without hope. We're separated from God, but we're also estranged from each other. We're separated. And so there's these, these two types of separation that are happening that leave humanity increasingly alone. And each individual having to fend for themselves in this world. But the narrative changes, and we find out that Jesus comes on the scene, and he destroys the sin that separates us. Look at verse 13. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through 
the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. Now, the background of this is the conflict between the Jews and the Gentiles, and I'll develop that more next week. But the point for today is just to know that they were not on friendly terms. In fact, they despised each other. Our whole, like, red-blue divide right now in our country, nothing compared to the kinds of differences that the Jews and the Gentiles had, how much they were hated, how much they hated each other and were hated by the others. They were very much separated from each other and, of course, separated from God. And that's really what sin does, right? That's what we see in verse 14. It creates these barriers of hostility and isolation between people and between us and our God. These barriers, we create them. We push people away for all sorts of reasons. We push them away because of race. We push, push them away because of money or status. You know, they have enough of it. They don't have enough of it. Privilege. We divide. We separate. We have entire systems that are based on caste system. They're just, we separate the people. They have to be separated. You're not a part of my tribe. If you're not a part of my tribe, then, then I keep you at a distance. We don't even get started on politics. How quickly that pushes people farther and further away from each other. I mean, we push people away, well, because they bother us. You know, they irritate us. They're not like us. They do things differently than we do them. And our self-centeredness and our, our clinging to our own ways, our lack of compassion, our lack of empathy for others causes us to just keep creating these self-imposed barriers that lead us to increasing amounts of aloneness. Charles Moore, he said, in a culture of connectivity where we have countless people to text and tweet, millions are under the illusion that networked life is a rich, meaningful life. But community is more than connectivity. Although it is easier than ever to communicate and stay in touch with one another, we are fast losing the ability to commune with one another. We know how to text, but we don't know how to converse. We exchange vast amounts of information, but we find it increasingly difficult to confide in one another. We no longer know how or think we don't have the time to give each other our full attention. Though we may not be alone in our virtual worlds, we remain lonely. Our lives lack cohesion. We live in pieces, in fragments, lacking any overall pattern or any steady, identifiable community in which we belong. Jesus comes on the scene and he says, this isn't the way it ought to be. So how does he do it? How does he destroy the sin that separates us? Well, we see it in verse 13. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, that's one piece of it, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And that's the other piece of it. And there's really, so there's really two ways described here. One of them is where we are brought back into connection with God because the blood of Jesus, how he died for us on the cross, has now given us the ability to be forgiven by God and be reconciled back to our Heavenly Father. And so in faith, trusting that what Jesus did on the cross was done for you, he exchanged your estrangement for his estrangement from the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Was Jesus' cry on the cross. What was he saying? He was being estranged from the Father so that you and I could be made whole again with our Father. We could be received, no longer estranged. That's the first step, how we get back into a relationship with the Father by the blood of Jesus. But there's another piece here that's important, and it's this phrase, in Christ Jesus. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away. So what does this mean? Well, this phrase is really kind of, a, it's, a, it's an interesting phrase. You think of it kind of spatially, right? So the people who were far away, the people who were nearby, here is Jesus. And as we enter into a relationship with God through the blood of Jesus, we're not simply now in an individual relationship with him. Now we are entered into Jesus. We, realm, we enter his realm. You are in Jesus from way out there, and you are in Jesus even though you are nearby but not quite in. And now together, we're all in Jesus. And the way we relate now is under his authority, under his empowerment. See, being in Jesus governs the way we now relate to each other. 
And he did this because he wanted to create out of the two, out of the many, one new humanity. That's what he says in verse 15. One new humanity. So, humanity. so he destroys the sin that separates us from each other by us being in him each and every day. He gives us victory over our sins that divide us from each other. From all of that self-centered pettiness, he says, no longer is that the way we are to live when you are in Christ. So he creates this one new humanity, and what he really is doing by kind of breaking down and destroying these dividing lines that separate us is he's knitting us together into a family. That's what he says in verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father. This is like interesting language because we, we do this, right? We, we all grew up with this. We all know that the Father language, like our Father who art in heaven, we all kind of, many of us grew up with this kind of language, and we just gloss over it. But we forget the profoundness of what that means. He could have gone by any title. We, we could have referred to him as awesome creator of everything. That could have been the, the major way. It could have been the, you know, the powerful Yahweh God, right? It could have been Grand Poobah. He could have given us any name by which to call him. And the dominant theme that we find throughout the scriptures is to approach him as father, as father, because he's, cre he's creating a new family. That's what he says, verse 19. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, you're no longer out there. You are now fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So now, God is the one Father, and we are brothers and sisters. We're family. We can't treat each other as strangers anymore. We can't treat each other like the other. We're not. He tells us in Psalm 68 that God sets the lonely in families. What a beautiful idea. God sets the lonely in families. Would you repeat that with me? God sets the lonely in families. Let's do that again. Let's repeat it. God sets the lonely in families. And if that's you today, if you're saying, that's what I need, then you're hungering for it. You feel it. You already know it. You're like, that's what I'm hoping for. I am the lonely, and I want God to set me into a family. And if you're saying to yourself, but I'm actually doing all right. I'm connected with people. I'm, you know, I got a lot of good relationships. And guess what? You're the family. You're the family that God wants to set the lonely into. He sets the lonely in families because he's creating a new family. The idea of the brethren is actually the most common title given to Christians in the Bible, the brothers and the sisters. It's the most common title. I was reading a guy this week, and uh, he said that, you know, most of us really love the metaphor of the body. So we describe the church as the body. And this is actually kind of, you've heard it, because it's my favorite metaphor of the body, and I always talk about it. There's different parts, and each person is a unique part, and all of you have your unique role to play, and some people are, you know, you're, you're a hand, another person is an eye, and another person is a foot, and all together... We each have our unique part to play in the body. And it is a biblical metaphor. It's, it's really great. It's fantastic. I personally love it. And then he goes on to say, do you think maybe we love that, that metaphor so much because it plays to our American biases? You know, like we love the individualistic side of all being part of the body. We love the fact that we have our unique contribution to make, that we're so task-driven that we have something to do. And he says, isn't it interesting that we love the body metaphor, but we, we don't talk so much about the family metaphor, which is more dominant in the scriptures. And I was like, oh, that's lousy, because it's not what I was hoping to do, but it, was, it really struck my heart. Because we are a spiritual family. You know, you don't get to pick your family. You can pick your friends all day long, but you can't pick your family. God brings them together. He's the one who grants you your family. And he takes all sorts of different people and he joins them into one new family. For Cheryl and I, this has been her, I mean, a wildly important part of 
our lives because when we left uh, high school and went to college, we were largely separated from our immediate family. And so we have most all of our lives lived away from our immediate family. And over the years, it has always been the church that has been our family. I don't know what we would have done. I don't know how we would have made it through so many different things, ups and downs throughout the years. No doubt a large reason, part of why uh, we're, we are doing what we're doing today is because of that, is because we've been folded into a new spiritual family. And I've heard these stories from so many of you who over the years you have just found so much hope and joy and challenge from your spiritual family. It's important. So take an inventory. That's what I'd love for you to do this morning. Take an inventory. How connected are you to your Christian family? Can you find these deep, genuine, life-changing, life-giving relationships? How many of them do you have? Do you have two? Do you have one? Are you hearing this and you're thinking, I don't know that I have any of the kind of relationship you're describing? And what if we made that our resolution? It's a great time of year, right? We're all doing that. We set all kinds of goals for the year. You want to do something that's unbelievably beneficial for your life and the lives of people all around you? Then commit yourself to your Christian family. Make it a priority. Some of you have never actually done that. You've never said, you know what? I am going to commit myself to my brothers and sisters in Christ. I am going to do whatever it takes to be folded into this family. I mean, like, what are you waiting for, right? What are you waiting for? To get connected to Christ, get to, connect, to get connected to each other. You, what, what is so awesome in your life right now that you're saying, I don't actually want to be a part of that? I don't want to, I, I want to continue in my estrangement from God and my, my spiritual family. We start off by simply making some friends. My wife was in a grocery store recently and uh, she heard this whole conversation fold, unfold before. There were two moms, each with a young kid in, uh, the, in the cart, right? And so they were going down the aisle in different directions. They didn't know each other. And uh, the, the one kid, he's, he yells out at the top of his voice. He's like, hey, friend, what's your name? <laughs> and the other kid, he, he kind of like looks around. He realizes that, you know, someone's talking to him. And he goes, Ivan. And, and the other kid, he says, Ivan? What kind of a name is that? <laughs> and Ivan says, I don't know. It's what my mom calls me. What's your name? And the kid goes, Sam. I'm five, and I'm going to kindergarten. And Ivan says, me too. And just at that point, you know, the mothers haven't even looked at each other. They're reading, like, labels on grocery carts, and they're kind of, like, going past each other now, and the distance is starting to grow. And Ivan, with indignation, looks at his mother, and he says, Mom, slow down. I am talking to my friend. <laughs> That's what we were meant for to find connections and friends and to be woven together into a community and to appreciate our differences and to, to relish in the similarities and to see this, this weaving together of lives. What would it be like if you had 10 or 15 of those relationships? 10 or 15 people who would drop everything for you when you needed them to? What would it be like if you had a dozen people in your life that when they were in need, you would drain your bank account for them? Because they're your family. Because they're your brothers and they're your sisters in Christ. You imagine having friends who would give you honest feedback about every, everything going on in your life and the decisions you're making and the way you're treating people. Imagine what it would be like to be surrounded by a group of people like this. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that we talk about, we, we encourage you guys to join a group. We do this all the time. We say you want to get involved in a small group because it's an entry point for some of these kinds of relationships to form. 
It's just one more opportunity. And we, we talk about it all the time because we know how important it is. In fact, we think it's as important or more important than what happens here on a Sunday morning. We want you guys to be connected to each other. We have 200, almost half, we have 250 people who call Beacon Church home who are not yet connected in any significant way to their spiritual family. And we just say, why? Why would you, you not invest yourself in such a way to start to cultivate and take full advantage of all of the incredible gifts that God is promising us through our spiritual family? A group of people that can know us, that would love us, that would sacrifice for us, that we can know and love and sacrifice for we encourage you guys, check these out. Because these aren't just simply Bible studies that interact with the messages. They do. That's part of what we do. But the studies aren't designed for us to simply gain more knowledge for knowledge's sake. These, these groups are designed to help each and every one of us start to live and practice being a spiritual family. Because it does take work. It is awkward. It can be difficult but the rewards are significant. The end goal of these groups isn't Bible study, it's shared life. We want to encourage each and every one of you to check it out. And then you take it from there and you make a commitment to invest yourself in deep Christ-centered relationships every single day. And see what God would do. Our hope and our prayer is for each and every one of you who calls Beacon Church home to be connected to your spiritual family, to have brothers and sisters in Christ that you can love sacrificially and who will, who, who will love you sacrificially. Let us help you move ever more into those kinds of relationships. I'm going to pray as the band comes back up and gets ready to lead us into communion, but uh, as they kind of come up, let's just, let's just ask for God to do this in our hearts. Father, what we need from you is a change in our own hearts, a, a change in our perspective, a change in our values. We need you to work our hearts, making them tender so that we might yield ourselves more fully and more completely. Lord, for those who are here who have never yet committed themselves to you, we pray, Lord, that they would decide that this is the day that they don't want to be estranged from their Heavenly Father anymore, that they want to be folded into the family. And then for each person here, Lord, I pray if they're feeling lonely, if they're hurting, if they've been away from community so long that their hearts are heavy, I'm praying, Lord, that you would give them the courage they need to take those steps to break down the barriers, to get over the discomfort, the fear, whatever it might be, Lord. Let them be folded into community. And for those who are experiencing it now, I pray, Lord, that they would open up their community so that there is a, there is a ready availability. There's another chair that's open so that God can place the lonely in families. We pray it all in Christ's name. Amen.